Right. Uh, yeah. So I, I'm Angus. Uh, I work currently for Amazon as a developer on EKS. Um, so my only real feedback on Stephen's excellent previous talk was he should probably use EKS CTL uh, if you don't want to use if you're not interested in using Terraform, um, which makes a few of those steps a little bit easier. Um, uh, that's about all. Uh, the otherwise, um, my nearest Kubernetes cluster is right there. That stack of laptops with Lego between them to keep them with airflow going. Um, that's that's anyway. That's my personal Kubernetes cluster. I've been using Kubernetes for many many years. Uh, I used to work for Bitnami, uh, which is where I wrote Sealed Secrets, which is what most of this talks about. So that's a reasonable point to plug uh, the Bitnami name. Um, Bitnami is now part of VMware. Um, and then before that, uh, other places. Um, I have, yeah, had a bunch of code in Kubernetes. I think 0.5 was when it was merged. So I've been around quite a while in the Kubernetes world. There were like eight reviewers back then and you could have knew everyone by name. Um, it's quite different to now. Uh, yeah, so this is about Sealed Secrets. Uh, and yeah, feel free to jump in with questions because I tend to make my talk up as I go along. I've got a couple of slides and then uh, uh, the second half is pretty much all demos. I didn't want to chop and change too much with the video projecting. So we'll see how that works out. Um, anyway, enough of that. Sealed Secrets. Sealed Secrets is, this is it in a nutshell. Um, you want to manage all your configuration through files in Git for, for lots of excellent reasons. Uh, and you can do that with every part of Kubernetes config except secrets. Putting secrets and credentials into Git, in particular public Git, is obviously a bad idea. Um, so sealed secrets is a solution to um, change that so that you can turn your secrets into non-confidential files which are safe to make public. And then you can then put them through your regular um, you know, GitOps uh, workflow. Um, so before I can tell you that story, I have to tell you this one, GitOps. Uh, GitOps is a name that's around a little bit now. Um, and I like that because before the name GitOps came out, I didn't have a good name for this concept. Uh, I used to call it declarative management, but no one else knew what that meant. Um, I know the Microsoft folks tend to use the term desired state, which is a good term. Um, uh, I have also heard some people recently call it infrastructure as data, IAD, as opposed to infrastructure as code, which is also a good name, but but less familiar. Um, the idea, this is, when I give a Kubernetes intro talk, I, I call out two things as being surprising but important parts of Kubernetes, uh, things that people usually overlook. Um, the the other one of those things is that it's designed for, for operations and designed for, for ongoing maintenance. But the first thing of those that I call out is declarative management. Um, the Kubernetes API is all based around declaring the result you want. You say, I want a deployment with this many replicas and this command line flag and this whatever, whatever. Um, you don't say, first install this tool, then do this thing, then do this thing, then deploy this, then restart it, and then sleep 60 and then loop. You don't say that in Kubernetes. You say what you want, the result, and then the magic Kubernetes behind the scenes takes care of comparing what you wanted versus what's actually running and making the match, making making what's happened, uh, making what's really running match what you wanted to run. Um, and this is a subtle but super important concept that's part of, of Kubernetes. Um, there's a whole operations theory um, and things behind that. And I can draw, you know, vectors on a whiteboard to help try to explain all of this. Um, but the, the nutshell is if you talk about the, the desired state instead of the steps you took to get there, if you talk about the desired state, you can move that around. I, I can, you can refer to that. I can say, this is what I mean. And you can say, yes, that's what you mean. And we all have a single thing we can talk about to say, this is the config I want to run. Whereas if you had a script and you're talking about like an incremental change in the middle of a script, it's very confusing as to what you, you're trying to describe. Because if you reorder that line, if you move it somewhere else, it can mean something different. Um, and this has profound effects over how you manage your config and how you can compose it into much larger, huge, complex systems um, and how you can analyze it without actually executing it and all these sorts of things. 
So it's a really big deal. That's a whole talk in itself, which is not what this talk's about. I'm just priming you with those ideas. Um, the GitOps is basically declarative management turned into files in version control, um, which is the most obvious way to do it and, and very successful. Um, it's every computer company pretty much these days has settled on Git in some form or version control in some form of Git usually. Um, and in particular, GitHub is very popular as we all know. Um, and so really what you're doing is managing your configuration through the same process that you already know how to manage code. You already have a strong workflow for code with, with peer review, with approval processes, with you know a uh, place to put analysis tools and, and unit tests. Uh, and then a change workflow where you get to roll it out and graduate it to different stages of, of your production infrastructure. So you're taking all that existing infrastructure and just using it for managing infrastructure itself. Um, and yeah, I like in this day and age, if you're not managing your infrastructure somehow like this. Yes. Yeah. You may be being hackled a bit, but Samuel asks, what about during complete configuration files? Uh, yes, this is, there's a, a long um, discussion by Brian about this, uh, where he comes in. Um, as you'll see when we get to the demo stage, I'm actually a big fan of JSON and kubectfg, um, which is Lambda expression. So it's Turing complete except for the infinite tape part. Uh, um, uh, but anyway, it's about side effects from my point of view. It's not so much the side effects you can have expressions, but you need to be able to analyze the config by itself standalone. It needs to be able to produce the same output, produce the same result. So you can talk about YAML with like um, Helm charts, uh, the YAML with Ginger with uh, templates, or you can talk about uh, Helm, uh, a basic YAML with, you know, said replacement of tokens. You can talk about all those sorts of things. They're all basically equivalent. I don't really care because you all know when you look at that file, you know the value, you know the result that you're actually talking about. And so I don't really care how it's described, what syntax it's in, whether it's JSON or uh, YAML or YAML with substitutions or JSON with substitutions or JSON with expressions, I don't care. So long as everyone knows what the result is without having to go and actually run it on a cluster. Um, just That's just a format choice. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, so not managing infrastructure via this is about as weird as not managing your code using version control. Like you just you just wouldn't consider doing that in this day and age. Um, so yeah, uh, pure functional. Yes, basically pure functional programming. Um, as long as you don't have side effects, I don't really care how you've expressed it in syntax form. They're all equivalent after expansion. That's enough for GitOps. So that's the. The reason that Sealed Secrets is interesting is because it lets you turn your credentials into the GitOps primitive. So you can merge it in with the rest of your your uh, GitOps workflow. Um, so Kubernetes, yeah, just for those of you who are new to Kubernetes, and I know the poll earlier was pretty good. We had a, a pretty even split of, of uh, I don't know, I guess in the middle of the journey. Um, Kubernetes secrets are, there's two types which are almost the same. There's config maps and there's secrets. And they're both ways to store shortish values that don't change very often. It's, you know, it's not a database. It's intended for things like configuration files. Um, the only real difference between config maps and secrets uh, is that secrets are base64 encoded. Um, this is obviously not a way to encrypt it. Obviously, Base64 is trivial to reverse. It's mostly so that you can put binary files into secrets. So you might have a, um, a like a ptor file or something, one of those sorts of um, credentials files, which is a binary format. Um, and so you want to preserve all the line endings and things accurately. Uh, but otherwise, secrets and config maps are equivalent. Um, the Kubernetes knows that secrets are secrets, so it tries not to display the values of secrets, whereas config maps, it's quite happy to display the values of in things like dashboards and logs. Um, but otherwise, no real difference here. It is worth noticing, mentioning at this point that Kubernetes will encrypt your secrets at rest when they're stored in etcd. 
So not by default, but there's an option you can turn on that's quite well documented um, where Kubernetes will encrypt this, the, the secret value before passing it to etcd. So then when etcd stores it, um, it's a big key value store. You can go and look at all the things, but when you pull out a secret, you'll get a, a blob that you can't understand, you can't decode. Um, so Kubernetes has a good solution for managing secrets at rest, but it doesn't give you anything um, to help with how you manage the secrets leading up to the point where they're going to Kubernetes. Uh, and that's where seal secrets comes in. So we have, yeah, so RBAC helps once you're managing secrets within the cluster. Once you've put them in the cluster, RBAC will help you control who can access it and who can't. Uh, and then obviously the final result here is that the secret is made available to the jobs that should be able to read it because you need to be able to get to that MySQL password or whatever it is. Um, uh, but RBAC is pretty good for stopping other cluster users from getting to it. But again, at the point before you even get into Kubernetes, um, that doesn't help. There's there's nothing there to help with that end-to-end -end workflow from from human sets up RDS or whatever and has a has a MySQL password. Then they've got to do something with that password and then something 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 and then it's in Kubernetes. That that middle part doesn't have a a fixed solution from the, the Kubernetes world. Um, so either you can manage secrets. What well, when I when I started on this question, yep, is the sealed secret stored in GitHub similar to the encrypted base sixty four string stored by Travis D I? Yeah, I'll get to the details right at the end of this. Um, but yes, basically, it's it's a it's still a base sixty four blob, but now it's an encrypted blob, um, is the short version. Uh, whereas instead of just a naive base sixty four encoding, um, so the when I started along this, what I did originally was what a lot of people do. I managed my secrets specially. I just said, well, I'm going to manage all the rest of my config through Git and GitHub. And then when I have a secret, I'm going to carefully manually generate the secret, run some scripts, sort of out of band scripts that help me insert that into the cluster in the right way, in the right place. And then I'm just going to go back to my Git workflow and I'm just going to assume that secret exists. Um, and that worked okay. Uh, obviously, it wasn't great once I started versioning secrets and once I started having a team of people managing it this way and I had all those issues for which I wanted the Git solution. Uh, you know, lots of people, a more complex environment, I wanted to be able to roll out and roll back and have um, the changes staged. You know, I want to use the secret at the same time the secret becomes available uh, and roll back past that point if necessary. Um, so at that point, uh, I, I went and I looked around. There wasn't really anything else around, so I implemented sealed secrets. Um, there are a few other solutions like this, but they tend to be general Git solutions, uh, Git crypt. And there's one that I can't think of the name of. It starts with S. Um, S, S crypt? I don't think it's that. Something. Um, they're general solutions for Git and just general files. The difference, SOPS, that's the one. Um, the difference with sealed secrets is that it's a Kubernetes specific solution. So it, it's a Kubernetes object. It works with the Kubernetes tools. Um, it is not decrypted until it goes into the Kubernetes cluster. Whereas um, SOPS and and GitCrypt, you as the as the human, you decrypt it, get the um, the plain text credentials right there, and then you might push them to your cluster. Uh, with sealed secrets, it stays encrypted until it's actually in the cluster. So here's my nice little diagram that I drew once upon a time. Um, just saying again, so it happens in two pairs. You get your secret, you run a cube seal tool. The cube seal command line tool encrypts the secret and gives you a sealed secret. The sealed secret is now not secret. It, it's not a confidential anymore. You can do whatever with it. You can put it through your normal Git workflow. Um, you can put it on a public GitHub repo. Uh, you can go through your whole workflow end to end, whatever that is, approvals, unit tests, everything. And then only after it's pushed to the cluster, there's a controller that runs inside the cluster and the controller has the matching encryption key, decryption key, and it will decrypt the sealed secret uh, custom resource object back to the the original secrets. Um, and then your regular Kubernetes jobs can consume it just like it's a regular secret because it is a regular secret. 
um, at this point. Uh, basically, it's pretty straightforward. Um, it is a fairly straightforward uh, use of public key cryptography. Um, it's not a complicated controller. Uh, in fact, so some of my question told... come in. Where is the decryption key stored in this case? Yeah, good question. The decryption key is stored in Kubernetes, and I'll show you that once we get to the demo section. Um, it's stored in Kubernetes as a regular secret, uh, and therefore protected by RBAC and encryption at rest and those sorts of things. Um, the controller creates that when you first install it, and will rotate it periodically um, if you let it. Um, so yeah, it's a pretty straightforward public key crypto. Um, the cube seal encrypts with the public key and the controller decrypts with the private key. Um, normally, of course, you would never take the private key out of the cluster, whereas a public key you can be fairly liberal with. There's nothing secret about the public key. You can, you can post it publicly. Um, in one of my repositories, I have the public key checked into Git alongside the sealed secrets so that anyone who can check out the public, the the Git repo can run kubeseal with that public key and can generate new sealed secrets. Um, and then it's up to my usual pull request approval workflow as to whether I accept those and merge those in the same way that I ch choose whether I accept config map changes via my, my um, uh, Git approval workflow. Um, it's not about the crypto itself. Thanks. It uses the things like um, shim set sharing scheme where you can have multiple pieces to decrypt, okay, two, three, or four, or five, and so on? Um, it does not. Um, it, that also wouldn't be very useful because you only want a single, you only want the destination to decrypt, and there's nothing, um, What's the word? Nothing confidential. There's no reason you want to restrict who can encrypt in the first place. Um, Go ahead. Sorry? Pick the Bitcoin guy. Pick the Bitcoin guy, yeah. Um, the, yeah. So, as I say at the end of this slide here, um, one of the downsides is it is a very simple workflow. It's also opinionated. It works very well for that one direction. Um, if for some reason you want to reverse that, uh, it, it doesn't help. So the original author, by the time they've made the sealed secret, even the original author cannot get back the original secrets unless they kept a backup copy. Um, or separately, if they can get to the cluster, they can get to the decrypted secret if they have the appropriate RBAC permissions. Um, so there's a question that's coming from Bernard Dubez that says, how do you enforce all of the secrets are encrypted in a Git repo? That's an implicit behavior using something like decrypt. Yeah, um, that's not sealed secrets issue particularly, but uh, there's no reason uh, sealed secrets itself needs to help with that. Um, the advantage of storing things in Git um, is that you can easily put in all these hooks. So you can put in um, a Git hook, a client-side Git hook that might run some you know, grep across your files and say, whoa, this looks like a, an unencrypted secret. I'm going to raise errors. You could do that again as a as a pull request, uh, server-side um, CI test. Um, you can do all those steps in your usual workflow, just as you would with code, you know, lint tests and things. Um, yeah, so git, git hooks. Yeah, you don't need git hooks to encrypt with this because you're not keeping the secret um, usually. Or at least you're not storing the secret in uh, Git, obviously. The unencrypted secret in Git. Um, yeah, so just just as a heads up, people who do use this do tend to implement other solutions around it. So you'll have this as your main ch change workflow, but then you'll have something else to either back up the master private key um, or you'll have a separate backup of the original secrets that you put into sealed secrets. Um, or what I prefer doing is don't do any of that and instead build a workflow that's optimized for regeneration of secrets. Um, so if a disaster happens and you lose the master secrets and you can't decrypt them again, use this as, an, as a, an opportunity to generate new credentials for your whole cluster. Um, the idea is with this workflow that generating secrets are very easy 
and encrypting those secrets are very easy and very open to automation because it doesn't require any special privileges to do that part. So you can have cron jobs and scripts and things that are generating new passwords and proposing new passwords as pull requests against your, your code um, frequently and easily. Um, but, you know, it depends on your particular infrastructure and whatever works for you. Um, yeah. So uh, I sort of alluded to this earlier. This is just here because we're a technical audience and people want to know these things. Um, it's a fairly straightforward hybrid encryption. Um, the It's RSA 4096-bit. You can't encrypt large values with RSA. So what I do is, again, what's commonly done, use a symmetric key, a symmetric cipher. So I generate a unique key. And then I use that unique key to generate to symmetrically encrypt the uh, actual secret, however big that is. And then now I just have a small 32 bytes that I have to encrypt with RSA. And then the final output is um, that encrypted unique key. So the RSA encrypted unique key followed by the AES encrypted um, actual body. Uh, that's a pretty straightforward way of using public key crypto. Um, yes, you can export the private key from one cluster and reuse it in another cluster, uh, obviously with the security implications that come with that. Um, anyone who has access to either um, master secret can decrypt the sealed secrets. Uh, so you've increased your exposure slightly. Um, one of the interesting things here, and I'll show this explicitly later on, um, is multi-tenancy. So what if I have a single cluster, a single controller, but I have two different teams who are deploying applications within this cluster and they don't want to trust each other. They don't want to expose their sealed secrets to uh, each other. Um, what sealed secrets does is when it encrypts, it also includes the namespace and name that it is expect that the secret is. Uh, and when it's decrypting, it verifies that the namespace and name that it's about to decrypt to matches. Um, and it'll refuse to decrypt if they don't match. Uh, this is great. The, the default mode is strict, uh, which is great for that multi-tenancy case. There are, however, cases where you do want to move the sealed secret around. Um, one example is unit testing, is, is test cases. You might want to spin up a new Kubernetes namespace for every test case and then tear it down again. And so, and also your secrets are not that confidential because they're just used for your test case. Um, so in that case, you would encrypt it in the mode that lets you move it to any namespace uh, within the same cluster. Um, and then similarly, there's another version where you might want to keep it within the same namespace, but you want to have any name. Um, so you might put a, a, a hash suffix on the end of your secret name or something. So the name is fairly dynamic. Uh, yeah, can you pick the cipher and configuration? No, at the moment it's hard coded to those ciphers. Um, I chose very generous key lengths because the assumption is this decryption is not done frequently. This is not like HTTPS where there's, there's frequent request responses. Um, and also the sealed secrets is, is possibly sitting in a quite a public place for quite a long time. So the lengths of keys that I've chosen here are what's recommended by the uh, NIST for you know 30 plus years. So these, according to their cryptanalysis, these sorts of key lengths are okay to sit publicly for 30 plus years. Um, they're they're resilient to that amount of brute forcing. Um, can seal secrets seal Kubernetes TLS secret types? Yes, it can seal any of the secret types. Um, the example I've got is a very simple one during the demo, but there's also a template. You can put a template section into the sealed secret, and in there you can put annotations, uh, labels, um, the secret type, basically any of the skeleton around the secrets that you want to be in the decrypted, the generated secret. Um, yeah. So now demo time. Um, let me just stop screen share and let's see how this works. Screen share, application window, that one. Here we go, by the power of Emacs. All right. It's a rock. It's just a little thin. Yep. 
How about that? Is that visible sized? Very visible for me and I have very limited eyesight. Excellent. All right. Uh, well, not so excellent on the last side, excellent on the font size. Good. Um, now, I so I have, I'm just going to create a cluster. This is just a simple local demo. So I'm just using kind and uh, Emacs doesn't like displaying the funny little Unicode things that kind likes to put there. It's got cute little icons. Um, so that's just creating a cluster there. What we're going to deploy is my simple example here. Here's my simple example in JSON and syntax, whatever, as I was saying before, the syntax doesn't matter. Um, there's a secret with, look at that, that's my actual secret there, S-E-K-R-E-T, very secret. And here's a very simple job, which is a busy box shell loop that just does what you probably shouldn't do and reads the password and echoes it to the log. Um, and then, of course, it's getting that secret by mounting it as a file in the usual Kubernetes way. Um, so, I, there we go, we've got our cluster. So, just to show that there's nothing magic going on here, that's the extra later demo, there's this one. So, that's the YAML that gets generated by that. Uh, there we go. There's just usual sorts of Kubernetes things. Um, there's our, our script. And here's our secret. Question says, based... What's kind and why should we care? What's kind, why should we care? Yeah, so note that the secret is base64 encoded there. That's just S E K R E T, no new line, uh, base64 encoded. Um, what's kind and why should we care? Kind is Kubernetes in Docker. It's a very simple, very lightweight. Uh, single node Kubernetes. It's good for unit tests. Um, it's not good for scale testing or anything high powered like that. Um, another good solution for local um, for local development is Minikube, particularly if you're not on Linux. Minikube with a K. Uh, Minikube creates a VM and then runs something roughly equivalent within the VM. Um, so I used to use Minikube. Kind is just slightly lighter weight if you're already on Linux and you don't need the VM layer in between. Uh, and Kind is nice and quick to start up and destroy again because no VM. Um, yes, yeah, so that's Kind. Uh, plain text. Um, yeah, that was that's just in my um, JSON it that generates the base64 version again because. Base64 is not secret either. It's just very lightly obscured. So um, that was just to generate the example. Obviously, I wouldn't check that into Git as is. So I'm going to kubectl. I'm not going to kubectl. I'm going to do the equivalent using kubectfg. Uh, that just expands the YAML and then pushes it to the cluster with a little bit of extra validation. But otherwise, nothing interesting there. So now I have. Uh, a cluster in my cluster, I have a deployment running, and it's spinning up that container. It's still loading up, and then that container, come on, container, start running. Uh, describe that container is that's the one I started. And it is currently, oh, excellent. Go to the demo gods. Fail to pull image busy box. Oh, that's just a timeout. That's all right. That'll retry. Um, anyway, we have to wait a minute until it retries or whatever, but that'll get there eventually. Um, while that is running, I will install Sealed Secrets, which we'll need for the next part of the demo. So this is a very simple cut. And may I just say, off the install instructions. Yep. As a vegetarian, we don't slaughter uh, the demo chicken. We slaughter the demo zucchini, and uh, you must have slaughtered. You must not have slaughtered the demo zucchini before this demo. The demo zucchini. Yes, yes, because the point was to sacrifice souls, and zucchinis have souls, right? <laughs> uh, there we go. So that's the controller installed, which we'll come back to later on. 
Um, this is now, what are you saying now? Image pull back off. Really? Why does... Two seconds. Pulling image again. There we go. I don't know why BusyBox wouldn't be found as an image. That's very... Not a very controversial image. Um, hmm. Anyway. Uh, do I care? How much do I care? I actually don't really care. I can just look at the secret anyway without being able to log it from the thing. Uh, so... Opportunity, Angus, to show us our common error, right? Yeah, common error. So, so here's me doing it using more familiar commands rather than Emacs awesomeness. So Kipsy to get pods, there you go. Oh, look, the image pulled back off. Um, my next step would be describe pods and then that thing. Uh, and that shows you a sort of user-friendly output that dumps a whole lot of information. The main interesting thing that this includes is here the event log, um, which is sort of like Kubernetes's um, per object log. So it's showing me logs specific to this pod. Uh, it's in a weird format that's sort of event-based and gives you repeats. It's designed to collapse frequent um, log messages. So the most recent one is 55 seconds ago here, and it was pulling image busy box. But I can see 66 seconds ago, it had image pull back off um, because pulling an image because going back up here, failed to resolve reference busy box latest. Have I broken DNS or something? Why would this not work? That's Maybe very it's strange. Kind of a name version perhaps. Or and this would be the time Anyone that you generally can chat, feel them. free to chime in. Yeah, this is the time that you'd be checking your, checking your tags to make sure that you've got the right tag there, it's accessible, and making sure that if you're pulling down from like Docker Hub or something, that you're actually doing a Docker login in there as well. Um, maybe not in this case. Yeah, very odd. Um, I don't really care because that job wasn't actually important. All it was doing was echoing my secret. Um, I don't actually need that to be running. Um, so ignoring that part, because that's weird. But anyway, the secret, there's my secrets, my secrets. Uh, and there it is, it's glorious YAML. And here it is there. I can copy that part. I can put that into, uh, what am I doing? Into a random temporary place. And then I can use more Emacs awesomeness to decode that on the fly. And look, it's what we expected it to be. Hooray. Right. So just to show you again, there's nothing actually secret about the secret, right? Anyone who can read that object can get to the actual plain text. Uh, right. Um, yeah, it should be able to connect to the internet. I don't know. It could have when I ran the demo earlier. Of course, I just didn't have a handy zucchini with me. Oh, I should mention, this is sponsored <laughs> by... Corona is the, uh, this whole session. Not really sponsored by them, just kidding. Um, I just had to go buy a beer for this evening. Uh, right, so that's how you would normally use a secret. Now, obviously, you wouldn't normally check that secret into Git because credentials. So what we're going to do now is convert this to a sealed secret. So I'm going to delete that secret. Okay, and it is gone. There's only the usual token there. And now I'm going to register mirror. Yeah, I should have. I shouldn't have destroyed the kind cluster. I should have reused my previous one rather than trying to be clever and show that as part of the demo. Anyway, uh, oh, an interesting one. Did the controller get installed? If this doesn't, yeah, this is more of a problem because the sealed secrets controller also had the same issue. Um, that means I'm actually going to have to fix this. Um, I could destroy the classroom, create a new one. That's always the first thing to try, isn't it? I could... Yeah, it's not a bad first choice. I have no idea why that would work, not work. Let's just use do that option. Anyway. Um... Do, do, do. Yeah, so anyway, I'll show the sealed secret thing anyway. I can show the client side of it. 
Um, so we have our secrets. Oh, that's cat, cat baby, baby. Cat, cat. Yeah, I just need <laughs> an actual terminal. <laughs> Start up. Although we are all having some higher things. I wonder if this video is sucking all my bandwidths or something. I doubt that, but that would explain the extra delay. Installing CNI storage class. Come on, come on, come on. You can get there. There we go. All right. Um, A watch to zucchini never boil. <laughs> <clears throat> there we go that's installed uh it pods pending pending is good i don't mind pending what i don't want is pending container creating container creating i don't want core dns i don't care about core dns yeah yeah the exactly. theory as internal chatter through your head as you're running the command Oh, what a hell I'm debugging. Yeah, sure. Sorry. Um, so I'm just seeing if Sealed Secrets is actually installing. Core DNS has installed. You can see here that Sealed Secrets is still container creating. Um, if it goes to pull failed, then we're back to the previous problem. Um, Uh, it's not getting installed on a new cluster. Yeah, image pull or oh, whatever. Something is going on. Uh, I ran that command just now. And this has downloaded that YAML and then applied it against the cluster. Yeah, yeah, I did it too quickly. Um, anyway, whatever, I don't really care. So cube seal. So what we want to do is generate the same secrets. So here is that same secret with a K. And then this is how you run cube seal. Uh, I want to do this mode and I want to do from file standard in and I want to do encrypt it only to namespace default and name my secrets and what else do I want? Strict mode which is the default. So that's going to dump out to the, no it's not, it's going to dump out not mode, what's the option? It is called scope always forget. Scope strict. Ah, oh, demo gods. Anyway, um, how can I actually show this demo with nothing actually working? The is that you've to... got a network problem, maybe a registry problem. Yeah, I agree. I just don't want to debug it with everyone watching because that's pretty boring. Uh... Stephen, if you were to unmute everyone and we could all chime in real time, that would be awesome. Yeah, fun. I'm sure that everybody's Here's... waiting waiting to say how they've had this problem about 4,000 times. Yeah, yeah. Here's a previous example anyway where I encrypted it and the output of that command looks something like that, um, which is show example sealed. Uh, when it's a sealed secret, it looks like that. So that's the most basic sealed secret object. You'll note the it's a custom resource. Uh, and instead of regular data, it has encrypted data. And that big base 64 blob is the, the SEKRET encrypted with AES and a unit key. And then the unit key encrypted with RSA. And then all of that appended together and base 64 encoded. Um, you'll note that uh, because I use the dash dash raw mode, it's only encrypting a single value, which is good because people can you can add new values here later on. If you decide to add more encrypted data, you can add another value without having to go back and modify this existing blob. So uh, there is another mode. Any sort of external or internal audit process? Uh, yes, nothing uh, like government level official. Um, but there's been a several companies who use this who've then done their own audit on it. And it's also been reviewed by the Kubernetes, uh, one or two folks from the Kubernetes um, auth SIG, who are the kind of crypto experts within Kubernetes. Um, so, so yes, uh, not to a certification level, but but yes, it has been but reviewed. Been, um, so while it hasn't had certification, it's certainly been peer reviewed by people who are right. experts in the field, yeah? 
yes, yes. Uh, and this is actually a widely used um, tool, uh, surprisingly to me, because uh, it's so, so simple. I, you know, but a lot of people actually use this um, if you're in the GitOps world. If you jump on like the Kubernetes hash GitOps channel, uh, it's one of the more frequently suggested uh, solutions to, to this problem space. Um, uh, but anyway, so imagine I did a demo and imagine I installed that sealed secret into the cluster as soon as I do. Demo. Yep. Um, do you want to just try just tracing that registry one address? Because um, it might be that that registry is down for you or down permanently. Can you just switch to the yeah, cloud one and that might, that might not... solve it? Uh, you had a timeout way earlier, like an IO timeout. I did. I did uh, timeout. I could probably just, there we go. That one. No, I can't. Sorry, this is Samuel, by the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, that was docker.io registry one. Yeah. That or, or trace just, just chuck it in your browser, whatever. Just just see if that works. It works when I do the same. I mean, well, while I was talking, I pulled the image on my other browser here, and it works on my other window, and it worked fine. Um, so it's something the same I registry could... though, or, or is it using a different registry? Is it using like registry zero or registry two? Like, like, is there something wrong with that uh... mirror? That particular mirror, and it keeps trying to go back to it. Interesting question, and it would be what cached in DNS, which is why we keep trying the same one. Uh, the, uh, can can you can you jump into that code DNS uh, to exec into the code DNS and do a DNS lookup, and say you can try to look up CNN or something from the code DNS part? Uh, yeah, sure. Just to see if your DNS is working. On the money one, it's like LGS versus what the cluster said. Yeah. Yep. Um, what's a good harmless one? Code yeah, that one. Yeah, so just do yeah. a NS lookup from there or something like that. Uh, this this will stress the Emacs things. No, there's none of that. How about that? No, there's none of that either. <laughs> uh, curse you, minimal images. Um, etcd, kind net. Who's going to have? Oh, they're probably all minimal. Yeah, busy box is the only one. <laughs> you can do this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, uh, it probably won't have any other command installed in there. Everybody else is uh, off. No, none of those exist. Has come across this before? Any ideas? Uh, I've had sort of similar before, yeah. just when things are slow. There's various hard timeouts in there, which I don't know if that's what I'm hitting here. But yep. There are various hard timeouts within um, communities, and there's configuration options to extend them. Uh, uh, and uh, if I Google, had, Google, have, bandwidth, Google yeah. have their own registries. You can very quickly just change some environment variables and switch to their registries and run it again, see if that works. Like Google, uh, like Google Cloud. Uh, yes, but I would have to change what registry kind is using, which is slightly more tricky. Uh, or is it? How do I do that? That's okay. That's the case. Oh. Yeah, yeah, but again, I just don't know how I put that through to kind while still using kind. I could use a different cluster altogether image, retain, log level. No, there's no good, easy option there. This is like fair programming what? over a video. Anyway, it doesn't really matter at this point because the demo works normally when the internet works. Um, I just get that sealed secret, I push it into the cluster, the controller picks it up, decrypts it, and produces the matching secret um, inside the cluster. So then outside the cluster, I would check in uh, that sealed secret, um, review it, push it through my workflow, uh, and everything's fine. That's really the only point of the demo here. Um, How to do it in kind, by the way. Excellent. Uh, local registry, oh, in kind, okay. Uh, create cluster registry mirror. Okay, if so it's, have to create if it's likely to take sort of more than sort of four or five minutes, what we're running really it is, yeah, time. yeah, and I don't think it's that valuable. Yeah. yeah, thank you, thank you for the help, but I, I'll just skip it, it's fine. Um, that's pretty much the demo anyway, yeah. uh, except with it working, um, otherwise, it looks the same. Yeah, Angus, I've got a question on this TLS secret. Uh, so yeah. We've been using the sealed secret for a year now. 
Uh, the, the thing is that it doesn't you it doesn't support TLS secret. Like if you go and create Kube Kube Cuddle, create really TLS sorry. secret. I'm really sorry for stopping you. Could you just let us know who who you are and where and where you're from, and then ask your oh, question? Oh yes, sorry. Uh, my name is Rajesh. Uh, uh, so I'm from the federal government. So I support uh, Kubernetes the infrastructure. Been, we've been we've been doing this for about two and a half three years now. It's an on-prem and AWS based. So we've been using the sealed secret for quite some time. Uh, the problem was. Uh, sealing the TLS secrets. So that's been a problem there because standard Kubernetes it supports generic TLS secrets. You can create, create TLS secrets. But when, when you use when you use kubeseal to uh, uh, create your seal as, as I mean secrets, it doesn't it doesn't so it only creates generic secrets and creates a ref for that, reference for that, as opposed to TLS secrets. We tried digging the entire version of you know kubeseal and um, um, like you know, even downloaded the very latest version of it, but doesn't support TLS secret at all. So that oh, you're saying in the latest version? Because I was going, I was going to respond. Yes, that was a bug for a few versions, but it was fixed yeah. uh, about a year ago, I thought. Um, yeah, it doesn't support. Yeah, it's been like, but this is what was even even last month I tested. Um, oh right, well yeah, then that's really. that's a, a new. Bug the problem is that like you know because when you create a sealed secret, which is a CRD or yeah. type, and it also internally uh, it creates a reference secret. Which you don't yes. do it, but it uh, seal secrets creates for you. But that see, that secret is a generic type, like you know, generic secret, um, uh, which you can you know base decode and encode it, uh, base decode it. But uh, we wanted like a TLS secret. You know the TLS secret how it looks like. It's got a TLS yeah, yeah. Secret. No, you can do that. Yeah. With, or you're meant to be able to do that with um, the extra templates. Um, yeah. If you have any examples, that'll be really great. Like uh, even yeah, yeah, not yeah. now, maybe like you know, you can send across, send me. That'll be really good. Yeah. Because I had we had issues where the ingress controllers, when we had TLS certificates, we wanted to use seal secrets to basically, yep. you know, version control the secrets. Uh, we can't do that thing with the seal secret. Yeah. yeah. So here is an example copied off. Um, YAML. Here is an example. Yeah, you can do that. Where are you trying to save it anyway? Uh, right. Um, there's an example copied off the Sealed Secrets homepage, um, which is not a TLS, but it's a Docker CFG type. So that shows how you can put a template in here, which fills out the rest of the secret other than the actual encrypted data. So when it goes to generate the secret, it'll use this to generate the, the skeleton of the secret, and then it will decrypt these values into the, the data part of the secret. So you would do something similar, but you would have um, the TLS Kubernetes.io slash TLS type in there. Got another quick question, uh, Angus. Um, let me know if it doesn't work, because it's meant to work, and I'm, I'm pretty sure there are unit tests yeah. to catch that um, following the breakage a year ago, so it should work. Yeah, there's a yeah. quick question there, which is, um, are there any admission controllers for sealed secrets? Uh, no, nope, very simple, just the regular CRD controller, uh, custom resource controller. Um, I Admission controllers, sorry, is that true? Um, admission controllers generally add fragility to your cluster. They are useful, but they're also a pretty big blunt hammer um, that goes into the path of every single API request pretty much from that point forwards. Um, so if they, if your admission controller breaks, it breaks your um, a lot of API operations, uh, and you have all of these side effects. If it's a if it's a mutating admission controller, you have all of these uh, like side effect um, ordering issues. So it's generally a, a pretty complicated. Um, so the the yeah, there's no admission controller here. Um, there is, however, the um, JSON schema in the custom resource. So the regular admission controller in Kubernetes will validate the sealed secret object on its way into the cluster in the usual JSON schema validation way. Um, if that answers your question.
Yeah, um, so you've got two options. One is to duplicate the master secret across clusters with the uh, slight security implications that come from that. Um, and then you can put the same sealed secret into both. It'll be decrypted in the same way on both clusters. Everything's fine. Um, the other option is to have different sealed secrets for each of the clusters, um, which is obviously more administrative overhead. But on the other hand, you probably should have separate credentials for each of your clusters anyway. So if, if you did have separate credentials, there would be no problems encrypting them each separately, um, which I know is sidestepping around your original question. Um, so that's your only two options with sealed secrets. Um, just for completeness, there are other options out there. Things like Vault is a, another popular option. Vault is quite different in that it's a whole secrets management solution. Um, and you manage the secrets within Vault and it does regeneration and, and uh, rotating and all those, those nice things. Um, but then you are managing your secrets through a separate process compared to how you manage all of your other configuration. So there's, I, I see them as, as very complementary and not overlapping. They're for different types of secrets. You would use something like sealed secrets for your infrastructure secrets, for the ones that are part of your configuration. And you would use Vault for some more um, dynamic real-time um, secrets that, that you want to rotate. Uh, and likewise, you would use something like Cert Manager if you wanted to manage TLS certificates that had to be signed by Let's Encrypt or something, and you were going to use them for serving. Um, so there's there's different solutions out there for different types of workflow that you want around the secrets. And you can mix and match them all within the same cluster. There's no reason why you have to lock yourself into just one of them. Yeah, this is the next talk, just done in the second time slot instead of the first time slot for random reasons. You wouldn't have noticed the difference if this was a regular on-site uh, meetup. It's only because the labels were put on the two different sessions that you noticed the order and change. Um, um, anyway, I'm finished. Uh, I had a last slide which pointed to the uh, URL, but you can use Google yourself. Um, it looks like uh, 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 Chromium tab, that one, share. Uh, but that's the URL. There's also a blog post on it uh, that I wrote a while ago that has that little paper airplane slide on there. Uh, and that's about it. So time to enjoy the Coronas. Excellent. Just if anybody, uh, just for a minute or two, if anybody's got any questions for Angus, we can see if we can actually vocalize them. I don't know if I'm asking for trouble on this one. Go on. Let's, let's, let's give it a shot. On, we'll all learn. Really, really, really hard questions. Kubernetes internals. He's your boy. Just ask away. Yeah, I, I, I can certainly have a go anyway with any Kubernetes question. There are some that I can't answer, obviously. What, do you, what are your experiences, uh, if I can just ask you a quick question whilst you're refreshing your tonsils, Yes. around um, two, two things related to, to, the, to the same question. Com commercially supportable uh, secrets, as in secrets management, and secrets management that will work uh, behind the interwebs. I don't know are, what are you they, mean by each of those, class? I'm afraid. Sorry? I don't know what you mean by each of those. OK, so commercially supportable um, secrets management solutions. Mm -hmm. Are there any that, that you have come across that do, do a good job that you can tell us about? or? Um, I presume Vault has a supported option. I actually don't know. I haven't used Vault in that level of deployment. Um, the there is there are a few things like AWS KMS, uh, AWS um, what's the other one? The the secrets management. There's a few wrappers around those services. So yep. obviously the service underneath is supported. But the thin Kubernetes layer that handles pulling the secret out of um, the secret store and making it available through Kubernetes, that might not be commercially supported in that sense. Yeah. Um, 
And yeah. yeah, I think each of the clouds has something similar to that. There's a thin layer which will let you wrap their secrets management solutions. Um, sometimes, interestingly, as a CSI plugin is a new way of doing that, which is quite a, a nice way of handling that. So you can mount the secret directly as a CSI plugin without going through Kubernetes um, capital S secret at all, um, which can be nice for things like the the um, hardware backed crypto that makes it appear magically on your instance. Um, yeah, Vault has some commercial options. Um, they're the one, yeah, CSI, sorry, is the container storage interface. It's the pluggable storage solutions into Kubernetes. So someone's written a pluggable storage solution for a secret, which is sort of a, a surprising mix of those technologies, but actually is a pretty good fit um, for, for some of these secret solutions. Uh, so Angus, the so Rajesh here, yeah, that CSI solution, um, so that means you will not see any secrets inside the cluster? With magic for those, thing? if you use those approaches, yes, that's correct. Oh, okay. um, which is why those solutions are interesting for workflows where you don't want to actually extract the the um, the secret text and put it into Kubernetes. Um, if you're willing to do that, then there's a whole lot of other solutions available. Okay. So we see we've tried seal secrets and we've also using CyberArk uh, mm -hmm. for the work management and also MicroPass. Uh, okay. Yeah, I'm not familiar with either of those, but it doesn't yeah. surprise me. That so the, the those two are just standard vault-based approach, uh, yep. uh, relying on token as opposed to the real uh, basic encoded value. Uh, but if, if you if you have like CSI, that sort of solution where we can completely get rid of, move away from secrets because secret is vulnerable. Uh, so either way, even if you use seal secrets, if you jump into the box, the seal secret is it, it, it's, it's, it's shareable from a developer point of view. But as an admin, when he jumps into the box, if he has access to the box, he gets into the Kubernetes cluster, you can still do kubectl, get secrets, OYAML, and you can see the original secret. Um, Yes, although put this into perspective. Um, yeah. Yeah, put this into perspective. The whole point of whatever your secret is, yeah. is to make that secret available to the final job. The final pod yeah. somewhere yeah. Yeah. needs yeah. to be able to yeah. know yeah. that MySQL password or whatever it is. So eventually there's some code somewhere in your cluster which can get to that plain text. That's, that's the whole point of it. Um, so yes, anyone who can modify that MySQL binary and who can modify that pod, who can jump onto the box and exec into the pod, jump into the pod, like jump onto the box and like GDB take over that process. Like anyone who has that level of access can get and to the secret. Um, yep. And there's nothing you can do that changes that because the point is to make it available. Um, so all of those come down to all your other controls. You need RBAC, you need to manage who can SSH onto the hosts. Uh, you need to manage as what user ID they run as. So you need to worry about all of those sort of perimeter issues um, because that's the nature of the problem. Um, if you wanted to use some clever hardware crypto token thing where the private key might not be available at all to the box and you have to pass yeah, over yeah. operations and have them done and then you, you pull back the encrypted result, right. that's... Um, you need a lot of support for that. You need support at the hardware layer or the, the virtual cloud layer for that. Um, and you need a way to poke through from your pod down to that hardware layer. And that's really difficult to do within any of the existing Kubernetes uh, structures. You can't really do that in a storage module because it doesn't look like storage. Um, you would need a special case. There's ways to do that, but you need special case solutions that, that don't map onto the existing Kubernetes primitives. Right. Yeah. If so, that's your concern. Um, yeah. the, the, main, the, the best solution here is to not have secrets at all. <laughs> the best solution is to do something like Let's Encrypt with a, with a fast rotation time um, or use the existing Kubernetes service accounts to do the authentication and avoid creating another secret for pod-to-pod -pod authentication. Okay. Um, or any of these other sorts of things. If there's some way you can come up with a, a mechanism, an architecture that doesn't even need a secret, then that's obviously the best solution here. But there are lots of cases where you can't do that. Um, usually yeah. involving external, something internal talking to something outside the cluster, you usually need some credential to authenticate to that. Yes, that's a, that's that's the normal case most of the time. Yeah, yeah. 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 So I think sort we've of, just got uh, sort of a tangent. We're definitely over time. So we've got one extra uh, poll that's just about to go out, I think. 
And if anybody's got that up on the screen. <laughs> hey, there we go. Awesome. I'm glad it came in that way. <laughs> awesome. All right. I don't know how to say a, like a round of applause uh, for um, Angus. Thank you very much. What, what we might do um, is just stay, stay online for another sort of five, five or ten minutes. And he's got any sort of further further questions, uh, you can sort of f fire away. Uh, just to reiterate, if Emmy joins with us a little bit late, if Emmy's looking for work just now, praying that this whole global catastrophe isn't going to happen, uh, please feel free to dro drop your details into the chat. Um, if also like if you found value in these talks tonight, and who the heck wouldn't? Uh, but please do um, make a point of going into meetup.com or Twitter at Meetup Madness or whatever, and just let let the world know that we're doing some good stuff. Maybe we'll get some other people back and we can do some more good. Okay, so I encourage you to do that. But once again, Angus, you rock, and we'll have a very, very silent round of applause for you. No worries. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, yeah, I should have given talks at the Meetup ages ago, so I've got a, lots of other topics I can talk about if, if anyone's interested.